Hello. Um, my name is Jeff Guan, and I'm the interim dean of the college business. And we have an amazing speaker today. And um, um, this is the uh, final event for the fall semester in the Menard Family Lecture Series presented by the Center for Free Enterprise of the College Business. And today, today's talk is also part of the Truist Speaker Series. We have a representative from the Truist Bank. And so we would like to thank Truist Bank for uh, helping make today's event possible. Thank you, Jeff. Um, if you are here today as part of the Cardinal Flight Program, and that's college business students, or the Center for Free Enterprise Reading Group Program, or you're here for class credit, as you leave today, there will be a QR code posted on the doors on your way out. And scan the code and complete the brief questionnaire so you get credit for attending today. Um, and if you are just here because you're interested in the speaker and the topic, we thank you. And you're also welcome to complete the brief survey at the, at using the QR code at the door. The Center for Free Enterprise uses feedback from these surveys to plan future programming. And now I would like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Will Scott, or William Scott. And um, we're so happy to have Will here today, because even though homecoming was a couple of weeks ago, this is a homecoming of sorts for Will. Um, Will received his undergraduate degree from the College Business in Business Administration, and he received his MBA from the College Business as well, so he's a double alum. And he also holds a Master of Philosophy in Modern Chinese Studies from the University of Oxford, the one in London. Um, while a student at UofL, uh, Will was a member of the men's basketball team, and while here the team claimed two Big East championships, that's the conference, and made it to the Elite Eight twice. And Will had a lot to do with that because I watched those games. He could make a really make a three-pointer um, under pressure too. Amazing player. And um, he was named Big East Academic All-Star. Will was also nominated by the university for the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. Will is here today to talk about life on Wall Street, something he knows about because he has worked as an investment banking analyst for Goldman Sachs. He also worked for Point 72 Asset Management as a portfolio manager on one of the largest and longest tenure teams at the firm. Most recently, Will has been with uh, Balsani Asset Management an American investment firm with offices around the world. He's held several positions at BAM, B -A -M, including senior analyst, portfolio manager, and his current position of director of associate and analyst development. Will, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I didn't realize you all receive uh, attendance credit for being here, so now I know why you're here. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I don't bore you too much. Um, but uh, my, my intention today is, is to give you all a little glimpse of what it's like to work on Wall Street, um, the various jobs that are potentially open to you, um, and then maybe getting a little bit deeper, telling you what it's like to work at a hedge fund and telling you about how we go about uh, generating ideas or trying to make money. So uh, first slide here, um, just a little bit about me. The uh, probably most important thing in the slide is, is the photo on the right. Um, it's my wife, Danielle, also a UofL grad. Um, she, uh, we, she graduated in 2010 or 2011. Um, she played lacrosse here at the university. Anyone in the room potentially play lacrosse? No, okay. Uh, and my two daughters, uh, Scarlett is uh, about three, and Chloe is one. Uh, this is us before uh, going out to, to trick-or-treat for Halloween. You can see that's why we're all smiling. Uh, it, 
didn't go well about 20 to 30 minutes after this photo was taken. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was a U of L grad uh, in 2009. Um, after that, I went to uh, graduate school at the uh, University of Oxford in, uh, in the UK to study uh, Chinese. Um, make sure I get away from that. OK. Um, and it just kind of maybe stepping back and going to show all of you guys uh, that uh, kind of where you think you're going to be today is may not necessarily be where you wind up. So um, at the time, uh, when I was leaving Louisville, I thought I was going to go work in government and potentially be a, uh, a diplomat or something like that. Uh, that was my interest in Chinese. Um, realized the more time I spent over in the UK and then living in, uh, in China for a little bit over a year, that uh, it wasn't quite for me. Uh, went back into, uh, into finance. I, I was fortunate enough to get a job at uh, Goldman Sachs in investment banking. Um, the easiest way to explain investment banking is basically um, trying to uh, pitch clients or pitch companies on doing transactions. So if, um, for example, you're Coca-Cola, you would get visited by a lot of investment banks uh, pitching you to potentially buy Pepsi or small companies. And then the investment bank would earn a fee if you decide to do uh, one of these transactions. Uh, needless to say, after a while, this constant pitching uh, got a little boring to me. I wanted to know what it was like to actually invest in things uh, and, and to, to analyze companies and, and stocks. And so I transitioned uh, from my time at Goldman to a place called SAC Capital, uh, which transitioned to be named Point72. Um, there I worked for a guy named Steve Cohen, who um, I don't know if any of you have seen the show Billions. Uh, the guy, Bobby Axelrod, his character is based off of Steve Cohen. Um, and that was a great experience learning from him, learning about how he looked at stocks uh, and investing in general. I was an analyst for him for about five or six years. Um, and then in March 2018, I left Point72 and joined the current place that I work, uh, Ballyasney uh, Asset Management. I, um, started there as a portfolio manager, uh, where I had my own team under me, and we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of uh, what that means, um, but made my own decisions around picking stocks and investing. Um, did that for about four years, and uh, I transitioned about a year ago to um, deal more with growing our firm through uh, developing younger talent. So um, I run a specific program globally uh, that we take Young, young kids uh, and, and train them for about six months um, and then find them jobs internally at the hedge fund. Um, so it's, it's much more rewarding. I get to uh, help people not make all the mistakes that I've made uh, on the investing side and then, uh, and then just get to see them grow um, from there. All right, so maybe starting out with just a little bit of background on uh, Wall Street. And I'm not going to lie, I had to look up most of this stuff. I, I didn't, uh, didn't know it offhand, but uh, the name Wall Street, as you might uh, imagine, gets its name um, from the Dutch settlers in, in the late 1600s who actually built a wall uh, along uh, where Wall Street exists on the East River to repel an English invasion. So, Wall Street. Um, the area didn't actually become famous for being uh, an American financial center until the late 1700s, um, when there was an agreement outlining uh, the ability to make commissions from trading securities there. So a lot of the initial um, trading that was done there was, was government bonds, war bonds, um, basically governments trying to raise money for, for the war effort. Ultimately, skipping ahead a little bit, um, it was formally turned into the New York Stock Exchange at around 1820. Um, the New York Stock Exchange uh, is now the largest global stock exchange in the world. Um, the NASDAQ Stock Exchange is actually number two, and that's located uh, right, where the, right near where the New York uh, Stock Exchange is uh, on Wall Street. Um, over the years, many prominent financial firms are, are located there. Um, the, the Wall Street, the term, is not necessarily directly, uh, fully, and only associated with a place. It's kind of now become synonymous with the American financial system, 
Um, but uh, several and most of the large financial firms in the world will have a headquarters or significant presence uh, on or around Wall Street. But I, I guess you know, the question, if I'm sitting in your seat and uh, what I knew nothing about at the time uh, was, what's the point of Wall Street? What do they actually do? What are all those people you know, running around who say they work in the financial industry actually do? Um, the, the, probably the simplest way to explain it is Wall Street originally uh, was used to help companies, governments, um, or anyone seeking to really raise money in order to grow. Um, that was where you'd go to raise the money, whether it's through a stock, which is offering ownership, or a bond, which basically a simple way to think about it is an IOU. Um, that would be debt. Wall Street was where you would go to raise that money um, in order to grow. So if a company, let's say, wants to build a factory, they would issue stock or bonds, go to Wall Street, raise the money, go build the factory, and grow. Um, over the years, Wall Street uh, got more and more complicated um, as more institutions um, found their way there and would, uh, would do finance larger projects, do lending. Now they do a host of a million different things. But generally, if you want to think about Wall Street, just to simplify it, that's the purpose. Over the years, too, the, um, the cultural influence of Wall Street has grown right along with it. This uh, picture on the right-hand side is Michael Douglas in the movie Wall Street. Um, I just realized most of you are probably born after that movie came out, so you won't get the reference. But um, I'm sure you've seen lots of movies and TV shows and books that, uh, that reference Wall Street today. So let's talk about the uh, actual career paths maybe available to you on Wall Street. Um, like I said here, what, is, what does everyone actually do? Uh, this picture on the right here is the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange. You often see uh, images of people shouting at each other, trading stocks, um, existing here. When in reality, this is not even how Wall Street works anymore. People don't really do that. Uh, most of the trading is done electronically. Um, the, the actual floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, has much less use today than it used to. Um, but it's, it's one of the misconceptions uh, that, that people have uh, around Wall Street. Um, this first bullet is super important. Saying that you do work on Wall Street can mean a lot of different things. It's sort of like saying um, you, know, you work in the medical field. Well, are you, you know, a doctor, a surgeon, or do you work in the IT department at a hospital? Um, it, it just varies. Uh, some of the common misconceptions here worth, uh, worth talking about uh, around Wall Street is you have to love numbers and math or you, you don't want to work on Wall Street. I have a lot of friends who, who work on Wall Street who hate numbers and hate math. They do something that doesn't involve numbers in math. They just work, um, they just work on Wall Street or work for a firm that's based there. Second one, everyone on Wall Street or finance knows about investing. Um, that is not true. So don't, uh, don't take tips from anyone just because they say they work on Wall Street. Um, I would say only about 70 or 80%, or sorry, 70 or 80% of people who do work on Wall Street um, don't actually do anything related to investing. Uh, they, they typically try to sell products or um, do something completely unrelated. Last bullet, uh, you have to have a degree from Harvard to work on Wall Street. Uh, that is also not true. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'm a little bit of proof that uh, any of you can do it if you want to do it. Um, it's uh, it, it, not true. Um, there are lots of potential careers overall on Wall Street. You, you really just have to know the basics and uh, think about what you're looking for and, and pursue it and do a little bit of homework. So maybe just to break it down a little further, uh, for all of you, giving you a frame of reference, uh, when people talk about Wall Street, the simple way to break it up is talking about what's called the sell side versus the buy side. Um, a lot of it is, is kind of like it sounds. So the sell side um, is, is institutions or firms that are selling something. Think investment banking, what I was describing to you earlier. Um, a lot of firms will sell their research. Anything really with a client uh, is, is deemed the sell side. Uh, if you work on the buy side, it's typically where you're taking capital and you're investing it. So examples of uh, the buy side could include a hedge fund, 
uh, most investment firms, a, a private equity firm, things like that. That's a very simple way to break up uh, what people on Wall Street do uh, to, to hopefully help you narrow it down a little bit. Some of these institutions on the right uh, represent the buy side and the sell side. So like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Jefferies, these would all be sell side uh, jobs. They're big banks, most of their goals, they do a lot of different things now, but a lot of their goals is to make fees on clients in one way or another. Um, Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts, KKR, that is a private equity firm, would be a, an example of a uh, buy side shop. Um, and then BlackRock today uh, would probably also be an example of a buy side shop, but they, they do everything, so. Uh, yeah, but mostly, mostly buy side and sell side here. If you think about it that way, um, you can start to narrow things down a little bit for yourself. <coughs> um, this slide, so how to navigate it all. Um, as I said before, you're, you're not alone. I had no idea what I wanted to do at your age. Uh, the first thing I would do is reach out to your professors, people you know who work in the financial sector to learn more. Uh, I'm happy to talk to all of you or anyone who wants to uh, pursue a career in the sector. I'm happy to, um, happy to, happy to chat whenever you'd like. Read books, do your own research. Um, three that I liked, uh, Barbarians at the Gate, Monkey Business, and Liar's Poker will teach you a little bit about different jobs on Wall Street. Um, and lastly, like I said, do your research online, um, research the firms that you, uh, you potentially want to work for, do social networking on platforms, um, things like that. You'll, you'll have to, at least in your stage, go out of your way to uh, be a little bit annoying. Uh, I know that may sound weird, but I, like when I was your age, I was a bit of an introvert. I didn't, um, didn't really like reaching out to people and talking to people, unfortunately. Uh, you have to kind of get beyond that if you are like that and, uh, and, and really just reach out to people who, who you can gain knowledge from and potentially uh, help you on later in life. Uh, this slide is, is super important because now a lot of my job is spent interviewing people and you'd be surprised at some of these interview uh, tips, do's and don'ts that I see even from people with a few years uh, work experience. It, um, it really is shocking some of, these, uh, some of these things that I see on a daily basis. So number one, uh, when you think about forming your CV, your resume, try to, if you want to work on Wall Street, try to highlight things in your education that you've done that are uh, similar to, uh, to that and prepare you for that role. Um, and also try to be concise. Uh, don't send a CV that's more than one page, typically. Uh, people don't really want to read it. Um, don't look unprofessional. Uh, I know um, this is probably an easy one, or show up late. Most of you, I'm sure, would never do that. Um, but again, you'd be surprised uh, how many people uh, do still do it. Act like a know-it-all, uh, self-explanatory, uh, get defensive or lose your cool if a question gets testy. All of you are going to go through interviews for jobs. Some of the questions you're going to get are, are probably designed to throw you off your game, uh, get you a little bit flustered. Don't be. Realize when you see a question like that, uh, that it's designed for that purpose, and uh, take a deep breath and, and try to answer it the best that you can. Lastly, if someone asks you a ridiculous question, uh, don't stay silent or try to just come up with an answer out of thin air. Talk through it, even if you think you're just talking in circles or being a little bit crazy. I, some of the uh, random questions that, I, that I've gotten in my career, which are just pretty much designed to elicit a response and see how you think, were things like um, you know, sitting down and having someone say, so how many yellow taxi cabs are there in Manhattan? Or how many windows are in the Empire State Building? Or something like that, ridiculous questions. But they're designed to, um, to see how you think and to see how you work your way through something and then to see if you get flustered or not. There's no right answer for a question like that. It's more, um, more just designed to, to see how you think. In terms of do's, a lot of these things uh, I, I just talked about, but definitely do your research on the person uh, interviewing you and the firm you're interviewing for. Know about what they do. Um, have good questions. I can't tell you how many times you get to the interview, end of the interview and you say, okay, do you have any questions for me? And you get silence. Um, that, uh, that, that is, that's not good. Um, definitely have questions about the, the firm, the job, the career, be informed. Uh, you'll make a really good impression. Quick little thing, write a thank you email, always, after an interview. It, um, it'll go a long way. It's a 
to take you two seconds to do, um, but uh, most people actually don't do it. And at your age, uh, three traits, if, if you work on Wall Street, that people are really looking for um, are hunger to learn, coachability, and your emotional resiliency. Uh, most people, I didn't know anything when I was in your seat. Those are three things that you have to offer. Um, and uh, definitely that's, that's mainly what people will be looking for. All right, so now that you know a little bit about Wall Street, let's uh, dive into a hedge fund. You know, what is a hedge fund? Um, specifically, hedge funds and the industry has gotten much more regulated over the past 20, 30 years. Um, but hedge funds are uh, investment firms that uh, use a lot of tools. They are, um, they take capital generally from institutions, whether it's pension funds, uh, retirement funds, high net worth individuals, accredited investors is what uh, these people are called. And they, their goal is to make money. Uh, whether the market goes up, whether the market goes down, their job is to make money. Um, this uh, picture on the left here, the big short uh, movie is a perfect example of, uh, of a hedge fund. A um, bunch of people yelling in a room that actually looks very similar to uh, to real life. So the hedge fund landscape is broken up generally into uh, three different types of hedge funds. Um, due to increased regulation, the landscape looks a lot different today than it did 20, 30 years ago. Believe it or not, 20, 30 years ago, you could do things like uh, insider trade. If you got in information on a company um, that others didn't know, you could act on that. Now that's illegal, um, except I think still, if you work in the United States Congress, you can still do that. Um, but I guess, so three different types of hedge funds. First type is, is old founders who are still around. These are people who started those hedge funds in the 80s or 90s. They typically make all of the calls, uh, all of the investment decisions run through them. A good example here would be um, this big short, this guy named Michael Burry. He runs a hedge fund out on the West Coast. Um, he is a very successful uh, manager. Second is newer managers who are trying to give it a shot. So one of the funds that stands out here is this fund called Melvin Capital. I don't know if any of you heard of it. They were involved in the whole GameStop saga. Um, the founder of that fund actually worked at Point72 uh, when I was there and went out on his own. And um, very smart investor, just got caught shorting the wrong stock when a lot of people uh, were doing the opposite. So he had to shut it down. Um, but there are a lot of people who still try to make a go of it today. It's, it's very prohibitive, the costs are very high to open your own hedge fund, and there's a lot more regulation. It's a lot harder to do, but some people still try to do it. Then there's the multi-manager or pod model, which is uh, a place where I work, um, and similar to Point72, this is, would be the Axe Capital representation. This is where um, it's one hedge fund, but you have a lot of different teams within that hedge fund investing their own amount of money. So effectively, they're their own little hedge funds, and it all gets aggregated up to the top. The way the hedge fund investment cycle works, uh, a client, whether it's a high net worth individual or an institution, will invest their money. The hedge fund will uh, accumulate all that money into their assets under management, or AUM. They will take a management fee from that. Then that capital will get allocated to their investment teams. Uh, at the fund, and then their investment teams will invest it, and hopefully uh, their investments will pay off, they will make a profit, and they will earn a performance fee from that. Um, that's how hedge funds make money, and if all goes well, that's, uh, that's how they operate. The three key players within a hedge fund are, number one, the portfolio manager. This is someone who handles all of the investing strategies and decisions. Um, for what goes where and decides how to invest in the assets. The analyst is someone who does all of the research on a company or whatever you're investing in the asset and will come up with or try to come up with the idea uh, for the portfolio manager to make a decision. Um, the trader is someone who then goes and executes that decision. So it's not as easy as saying, hey, you know, if I'm a portfolio manager, I want to buy um, stock X, Y, and Z and you click a button and you buy it. The problem comes into effect with um, the amount of money that you're trying to manage. So if you're trying to buy $10 worth 
of a stock, um, usually no big deal. But if you're trying to buy $10 million worth of a stock, you have to know how much that stock trades uh, in order to not affect the price too much. So what I mean by that is, um, let's say I'm trying to buy uh, $10 million worth of a company that uh, only sees their stock trade about 4 or $5 million worth a day. It's going to be a problem uh, because A, there's not enough stock out there, and if I want to go hunting for it, um, then I'm going to have to pay up and push the price up too much, and then I might not make money from my investment. Um, a trader will also be responsible for reading the, what's called the flows of the market. So the trader is a great source of information. If you ask them information on who potentially is buying a stock, you can learn a lot from that. Um, what I mean by that is if you see a type of investor buying a lot of a stock, maybe they know something. If you see an investor selling a lot of stock that they've owned for a long time, maybe that also tells you something. That's the trader's job, kind of the, the gatekeeper of information that can help inform the team and also the person who gets all of the execution done. So the idea generation process. This is um, the, the lifeblood of any hedge fund is uh, your ideas. If you have good ideas and you invest in things um, that make money, you survive. If you do not, you don't make any money and you do not survive. Um, this, again, is a funny little image here on the right of uh, Bobby Axelrod for uh, Axe Capital, what's your level of certainty? I think here he's talking about insider trading, which most people don't do and you should not do. Um, but ideas uh, generally, uh, the way they're created, is that they result from some kind of significant change. Uh, maybe it's a new product, maybe it's a new management or change in the competitive landscape of some kind that you can identify. Um, the, a real good idea is, is an idea where you see something that you think the market is missing. Um, a lot of these uh, ideas can potentially arrive, arise from the magnitude of the change. So let's say a company is launching a new product and you um, do your research on it, you talk to people, and you think this new product is going to be huge. But the market doesn't. The market doesn't think it's going to be that impactful of a product. That could be something differentiated. And if you were to buy the stock, and it goes up, and you're right, that would be the example of, of some good work. Um, so the idea is generally lifeblood of, of any hedge fund, uh, and you have to have good ones to stay in business. This is a, another slide with, with just a lot of text. Um, you know, what causes investment ideas, something that we, we just talked about, and then possible sources of investment ideas. Um, you know, as I said, and we'll go through a couple examples maybe on the next slide uh, to show you a little bit more of what I'm talking about, but um, change in, in macro variables, uh, change potentially in, uh, I think um, Dean Moyer knows this really well, but Porter's Five Forces, any kind of change in that framework uh, would potentially cause an idea. Uh, change in, in any kind of management or structure or um, anything like that. The key word here is change. Uh, if you notice a change or see something through work that the market um, doesn't, that is, that is how you come up with a good idea. Okay, so let, maybe let's just go through a couple examples uh, here of, of what a, a good idea might look like. So this picture on the right is a stock chart. Uh, this shows the price of a stock over time. Um, if you'll see on the bottom left, uh, it starts at the beginning of 2020 and it goes all the way to today. The company it's talking about is a company called Planet Fitness. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. They're uh, a gym. They sell low-cost memberships um, to, uh, to consumers. Now, uh, if you were a good investor, and I'm not saying that, uh, that we call this correctly, because we did not, but um, if you see early there in 2020, number, where the number one arrow is, um, people start to realize that there is COVID happening in China. Uh, originally, the thought was, okay, this is really bad for China. Um, we would like to not be involved or bet against any stocks that have significant exposure to China. Um, as it spreads, you start to hear of the first case in the US, the thinking completely changes. And now you think, oh my goodness, this is gonna be global. How is this gonna impact the US? 
Um, now at this point, right when you hear about the first case in the US, a good analyst would look at it and think a little bit critically about how it could play out. Um, if people do get this virus, are they gonna be apt to go out more? Are they gonna stay home? What kind of businesses or companies could that affect? Um, and Planet Fitness is a perfect example of one company. As you see the second arrow here, so see the stock price drop all the way down. That would get massively affected. Um, so if you had a view in January, February, or March before that stock drop, the Planet Fitness was going to um, be really affected because people would stay home and they wouldn't go out to the gym as much. You, that would be a really good trade. You could make a lot of money. Or, um, and you'll see the stock today, if you go all the way to the right, it still fully hasn't recovered to where it was before uh, COVID happened. This would be an example of a macro change and noticing that before uh, someone else does um, would, be, would be a good trade. This one uh, is talking about more specifically demand or industry change. So again, this is a stock chart here. The company is uh, Fresh Pet. I don't know if you all have heard of that. They produce dog food. Um, I unfortunately buy uh, too much of it for my two dogs, but um, the company goes public or starts to trading on an exchange for the first time in uh, 2000, late 2014. We started looking into the company in 2016, 2017, um, and then around 2018, uh, an analyst that I had working for me uh, discovers an edge. Now, what was this edge? He realized that we had been ordering the product just to kind of test it for samples, see if it was good or not. Um, and he noticed that every time he would order the product, he would get an order number. And so if you order it one week, you get you know, product number 10 delivered. And then the following week, uh, you order it at the same time and you get product number 20 delivered. So from that, you can kind of figure out if you know how many products are being shipped in that week, you can figure out how many products they're actually probably shipping in the quarter or in the year. Uh, and knowing what the average cost of a product is, if you multiply the average cost of a product times the total amount of products that they're shipping, you can get a pretty good sense of what their total revenue is gonna be for a period of time. Anyway, he figured that out, um, and we realized that they were probably going to sell a lot more of the product than people had expected. Uh, and so we bought the stock, first arrow, and did well in it. And at, at some point, the company <laughs> figured out that people were starting to do this. They took the, the product order numbers off of it, uh, and, and they don't do that anymore, I believe. Uh, the market figured it out, as the market always does. And then uh, you hit the top, and that strategy no longer works and you need to think about something else creative uh, in the stock in order to, to make money. Um, but those are just a couple examples of, of ideas. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, and I think I will stop there and maybe take any questions about uh, Wall Street, hedge funds, your careers, anything at all. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I, I do stock trading as a hobby, and I've specialized in uh, penny stocks. Mm. Um, so there is something I've observed over time, and I was just waiting to ask you that today, uh, in those penny stocks. Like, they keep on spiking um, crazily most of the time, and uh, from where we sit as, um, as uh, retail traders, you tend to think probably there are people influencing um, these kind of spikes. So for someone who, is, uh, who has been in Wall Street for some time like yourself, um, do you think like the feeling we have as retail traders, uh, does it make sense? Are there people who pull strings to ensure these uh, stock prices rise that crazy? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. I would say that definitely does happen. For penny stocks in particular, um, those typically will not trade on a large exchange. Um, what I mean by that is if you have a stock and it trades on a large exchange, they're under more scrutiny, there's more regulation, um, it's a lot harder to do something like that. Uh, a penny stock will not typically trade on large exchange, which means that 
those markets are a little less uh, regulated, and so you have some funny business um, that can that can often occur. Um, well, I was I was actually just thinking, talking about this semi recently with someone. There was an, an exchange, a very small exchange, not a a big one, and you saw every day um, this group of stocks would would rise throughout the day, and then in the last 30 minutes of trading would massively sell off. And every day, like clockwork, it would happen. Um, and you found out subsequently, uh, a few weeks later, there were some uh, funds up in Canada or something that were uh, playing games and trying to manipulate the stock. Um, but typically with penny stocks or with uh, stocks that don't trade on the large exchanges, you can, you can see that a lot. Uh, on the large exchanges, um, it's hard to say it doesn't happen. Uh, I'm sure it does, but it's much less frequently. They're under much more uh, scrutiny around that stuff. Hi, I just have a quick question. Um, I'm graduating in May, and I'm actually um, accepted a job to do foreign exchange trading. And I told one of my professors this, and he warned me that I'm going to get replaced by AI. Um, <laughs> so I just was wondering um, what your thoughts about, about that was and what the job outlook would like for that. Yeah, I think AI, I mean, it's fascinating because it's, it's massively changing. Um, you know, my view on AI is it's, it is a transformative technology, but I think that people have probably got ahead of themselves in terms of how much impact it's going to have on society as quickly uh, as they think. Um, you know, I, I remember when um, was it the, the internet was kind of starting. Uh, people thought immediately it was going to take over the world and put everything out of business. Uh, here we are, you know, 20, 30 years later, and there are a lot of companies that are still around. So, you know, I do think um, AI is, is a transformative technology and, and will have a huge impact on all of our lives. Um, it's, it's just going to take longer, I think, for people to get there um, than, uh, than forecast. If you look at, honestly, what, what, and the, the best thing to do around that is if you want to, to really stay on the AI curve is listen to what companies that are in the space are saying. Um, so you had probably around a year ago, uh, maybe eight, ten months ago, you have a lot of the, the chip makers for AI, the people that make the actual chips, uh, companies like NVIDIA, um, massively uh, positive on it, making tons of chips and saying, oh, it's going to take over the world. And then the companies that would buy those chips from them to use the AI, say like Microsoft, who's coming up with an AI program uh, and needs to buy those chips. They uh, are now kind of saying subsequently, like, pump the brakes. We don't necessarily need as many chips. We need to still figure out a little bit how this works. Um, so I think, you know, it is going to change the world, but it's just going to take more time, I think, than, pe than people expect. So what's it like being an investment banker? Um, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it teaches you a lot about the financial industry. Um, you, you get a front seat to uh, how companies are thinking about um, operating, how, think, how they're thinking about kind of moving forward. Uh, it teaches you a lot about the application of all the finance that you learn um, in, in school. So um, things like financial modeling, it's, uh, you learn a lot of the, th the theoretical stuff behind it and then you're forced to sit there at a computer and actually figure it out on your own. And if, you put in numbers that are wrong, uh, it's not going to go well for you. So it, you get the application side of it um, uh, to, to learn a little bit more there. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great pathway for a lot of different things in the financial industry. Thanks for the question. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you for your time today. My name is Prince. Shilling. Of course. Prince, nice um, to meet you. I just want to ask you, because you said you, like you just spoke about earlier, about being a Goldman Sachs as an analyst, and now you're in a position to where you're training analysts and associates. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to ask you, throughout your time, what are some tips or advice that you've learned from being both in those seats of being an analyst, but also being the person that oversees the analyst, in a sense? What are some things that you've seen, or and even more upon that, what are some things that that you look back upon now that you realize you could have been better at while you was in, a, in years as an analyst? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. I think um, uh, one of the things I, I touched a little bit on, but I would definitely, you know, I am in, in more of an introvert. I would, I would definitely reach out to people more. Um, 
and pester people, borderline be annoying to just get to know more because at your stage, uh, and when I was an analyst, um, you just frankly, you just don't know a lot. And so you're, you're trying to soak up as much information from as many people uh, as possible, as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, if there was one thing I could say, it would, it would be to do that, you know, be persistent, contact people, um, get to know as many people as you can uh, because you'll, you'll learn quickly. Uh, and don't worry if you're being annoying uh, because people like in my, in my position want to help. So, um, so don't, uh, you know, don't hesitate to do that. Um, so you talk a lot about like numbers when you're making a decision about something. Would like I guess social factors or politics or just upcoming you know maybe changes in regulations do those play as big of a role or is it just kind of something you need to look out for? Like I know some people are boycotting Starbucks right now. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean that stuff matters and that's. Um there's, so there's, there's two ways to kind of look at a stock or a company. The people, the way they think about it is either you talk about it from a, a bottoms up perspective, which is where you're really looking at the company, you're looking at the financials, you're doing all the work there. And then there's what's called a top down perspective, where you're looking at sort of those things, the macroeconomic impacts, um, you know, things like elections matter. So Next year, we'll have a big presidential election. The stock market will move. You'll see certain stocks um, move up if, based on the odds of who wins, a Republican or Democrat. So, um, you know, based on their positions. So let's say uh, a Democrat uh, takes certain positions that are favorable to certain types of companies. Those stocks will tend to rise if the odds of a Democrat winning goes up and fall if the odds of a Democrat winning go down. So the market uh, does factor those things into play. Uh, as well as the, the bottoms up uh, financials of any specific company. Hello. All right. Well, yes, thank you for your time. And um, yes, you said how like not all the jobs are um, investing and like doing with stocks and like that. So I was just curious, is there room for like marketing on Wall Street, specifically multicultural marketing? Yeah, I, there absolutely is room for marketing. I mean, all of these huge firms have massive marketing departments. Um, the firm that I work for now has a massive marketing department. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all types of roles within any of these firms um, available to you. Of course, thanks for the question. Hi, so um, I'm Griffin. My question is, you kind of touched on this in the um, talk, but when major, uh, when everything happened with GameStop and um, some of the major brokerages stopped trading, including Robinhood, since then I have heard somewhat conflicting, um, uh, it, it, the media is somewhat conflicted about whether that was a normal, ethical, reasonable thing to do or whether that was um, to protect other investments that the companies were exposed to separately. So I wanted to get your take on that. Um, you mean like when Robinhood or, or platforms like that stopped trading the stock or wouldn't allow you to do it? Yeah. Um, the honest answer to that is there's, I would imagine there's probably some type of funny business going on. Uh, but Robinhood or apps like that, Robinhood was a newer company at the time. Uh, they were probably, had never seen that kind of volume in a stock before and were not certain or, or worried how it could affect uh, their other operations. Um, so what a lot of these people, I'm trying to think about a, a way to simplify this a little bit. Um, so when you short a stock, you basically, the way it works is uh, you will borrow the stock from, um, from let's say Robinhood. You'll say, I wanna borrow GameStop. Then you'll go sell it in the marketplace and you'll get $20 or whatever GameStop is worth. Your obligation then is to then go buy back the stock and give it back to Robinhood. Uh, and the, the goal is if the stock goes down, you go back into the market and you buy it at a lower price than when you sold it, so you'll make money. If it goes up, uh, then the reverse will happen and you'll lose money. What I suspect was going on is that you had a lot of people um, buying or shorting GameStop and Robinhood, uh, they weren't sure, A, whether any of these people would go bankrupt or how it would all work and then how they would be left holding the bag, potentially. 
and so they decided to pause it. Um, but again, I, you know, I don't know whether there are other factors. There, there's a big counterparty in that uh, transaction called this big hedge fund called Citadel. Um, could have influenced them. I know Citadel was a lot of their what's called market making, so they traded a lot of their stocks through Citadel. Um, Citadel was losing money on that position, may have told them uh, to knock it off or something like that, I don't know. Um, but the answer is that uh, it's probably a little bit of both, that, uh, if that makes sense. What, what about like the bank stocks now with, with Silicon Valley and all the failures this spring, what, what's the street thinking about big regional banks like the PNC or whatever, are banks out of favor now? Yeah, I think, I mean, the stuff that happened earlier in the year with the regional banks, um, the crisis is over. Uh, I think investors generally in banks right now are a little hesitant for other reasons. Um, would be a simple way of talking about it. Whether, you know, um, whether they're, they're worried about potential interest rate risk, uh, how that happens, or um, a lot of these banks will take money and they will buy treasury bonds. Um, sometimes this, probably the simple way of explaining it is uh, a lot of their um, bonds may no longer be what they worth, or may, long, may no longer be marked to market what they're worth. Um, it's due to an accounting rule. Um, it's not worth getting into, but, uh, but, but generally, yeah, their banks are, are out of favor a little bit right now for, for other reasons. Um, I think people aren't as worried about the run on banks anymore uh, and more um, other factors in general. Hey, yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, within your line of work within the hedge fund, how does the, I guess, fluctuation in interest rates being so high, how does that affect, I guess, what you do within your line of work, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to think about it is interest rates um, are like gravity to all investments. So when interest rates go up, your investment goes down. Think about, you know, uh, home prices. When typically, when interest rates go up, it's harder to buy a home, right? You have to get a mortgage, a higher interest rate, so then the demand for homes will go down. Um, stocks act very much in the same way, so does really any asset class uh, with interest rates. Bonds act the same way, price will go down. Um, the market right now, and you know, my belief, at least, you know, who knows in the short term, but the market's done well recently. I think a lot of that is because um, people think that we're done raising interest rates. The Fed had a meeting a week ago or two weeks ago, um, and uh, most of the market thinks that the Fed is done raising interest rates, so they're you know, screaming yay. Uh, what I think is going to happen is the market's going to realize uh, at some point in the near future that uh, the reason the Fed may be done is because growth in the economy is slowing, which is not a good thing, um, so it'll take some time until they, they shift their focus to that. But um, generally, yeah, easy way to think about it is Interest rates go up, stocks go down, and asset prices go down. Um, but, um, and then reverse is also true. I just wanted to know, um, for investment companies, uh, when you're making decisions to invest, do you, are there times that uh, you day trade, or do you just um, invest in the long term? Like, are there instances when you spot certain opportunities where you buy stocks today and sell them tomorrow? I would say, uh, if you're an individual investor, the simplest thing to do, and what I do uh, with my own account, is to buy stocks and hold them. It's, it's not worth your trouble, it's not worth the time, and honestly, most, you know, most of the time, you're not gonna beat the market. Um, for an investment firm, for my day job, uh, you're trading stocks all day. Um, the reasoning, to that is you're trying to um, you're trying to just figure out some you're trying to figure out a short term gain is the simplest way to put it um, and and in order to figure out a short term gain you have to trade stocks a lot um, this is less advantageous uh, for um, for an individual investor because you're not going to have the access to the information that a lot of these large funds have um, and you're not going to be focused on this twenty four seven so uh, I'm not giving any investing advice, but uh, I would not try to do that. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, I learned so much, and uh, so let's 
Give uh, Will a warm round of applause. Thank you.